Thank you everyone for joining us today and welcome to the third event in the 2023 Hudson Valley Farming Webinar and Field Day series, Farming in a Changing Climate. My name is Jenna Walzak and I am an Ag Climate Resiliency Specialist on the CCE Harvest New York team. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to take a minute to thank um, all the partners who have helped to put this series together. Um, and these partners include New York Soil Health, Ulster County Soil and Water Conservation District, Orange County Soil and Water Conservation District, Glenwood, the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets, uh, the New York State Soil and Water Conservation Committees, and the CCE um, offices in Ulster, Orange, Columbia Green, um, and the, the CCE Harvest New York team. Just a few housekeeping notes before today's presentation. Please make sure um, you are on mute and put any questions in the chat. Um, our presenters may answer some questions during their presentations and we'll have time at the end for Q&A. Um, so today we are very happy to have two presenters. Um, Debbie Eller from Cornell uh, so New York Soil Health will be presenting on the benefits and practical applications of biochar. And then um, at the end of today's presentation, Mike Roth, uh, a biochar producer in Ulster County, will give us a brief overview of his biochar system that we part of the field day on March 24th in Ulster County. Debbie Eller um, is an extension associate at Cornell University and program coordinator for the New York Soil Health Initiative. She conducts applied research and coordinates extension activities that assist agriculture producers improve soil health by using sustainable soil management practices. Debbie earned her um, Master's of Science in Environmental Science and International Development from the University of Edinburgh and her PhD in Soil Science from Iowa State University. She also serves on the Board of Directors for the United States Biochar Initiative. Um, so thank you so much, Debbie, for joining us today. Um, and with that, the floor is yours. Great, thanks so much, Jenna, for, for the invitation to be here with you all today and be a part of um, your uh, webinar and field day series. So let me just get this going in presenter mode. Of course, it hates when I do that. What <laughs> um, screen do I need? Right. Um, nope. Sorry, wrong screen. <laughs> Okay. All right, hopefully you can see the, the full screen there. Um, perfect. All righty, let me minimize everyone here, make that a little bit easier. So yeah, all right. Well, we're a small group here today, which is great. So um, I you know, feel free to enter um, questions into the chat at any time. Um, I know most of most of the folks on on the webinar today, which is it was really great as well. Um, so as Jenna said, um, I'm Debbie Aller. I'm an extension associate at Cornell University and I um, am one of the program coordinators for the New York Soil Health Initiative. So um, there's a lot happening right now in the soil health world as as many of you know and are aware of and and one of the most interesting aspects of that um, has been questions around biochar and, and other soil amendments. There are a lot of soil amendments um, that have been used for a long time. Um, biochar has as well, but um, biochar is a much newer soil amendment for the majority of producers within New York State. So Jenna had asked me as part of this webinar to talk not only about biochar, um, but other soil amendments and also kind of give a general background of how it all relates to the carbon cycle and soil organic matter and soil organic carbon as a whole. So um, the way I'm going to move through my presentation today in about the next 40 minutes or so is um, the first few minutes will be just background on um, the carbon cycle and soil organic matter and the different pools of soil organic matter. Um, and then I'll move into just a very brief overview of some different soil amendments that are more commonly used on farms of, of various different sizes and are working with different commodities. And then I'm going to spend the second half of my presentation really focusing on biochar. And for folks who have um, some of the folks on this um, call or webinar today um, have seen some of this information before um, and 
but hopefully there's some new information as well that, that you'll find beneficial. So moving on here, just a high level overview of a very uh, simplified version of um, the, the carbon cycle, um, really showing the role of soil organic matter within the carbon cycle. Um, let me see if I can get this. And so you can see uh, plants take the, the atmospheric carbon, use that carbon dioxide, use that as energy, um, and and utilize that within photosynthesis to grow. Um, as as crops die, um, there will be various residues that that input carbon into the soil, um, and that carbon becomes a component of soil organic matter. Um, and then soil organic matter that can be lost in the system through erosion, decomposition, respiration back to um, CO2 within the atmosphere. So very simplified cycle of um, carbon, uh, the carbon cycle here. But I think it's important to really differentiate, and this is something often people confuse, is, is the difference between soil organic matter and soil organic carbon. So just defining those to start. Um, if folks were on the webinar two weeks ago, um, by my colleague, Joseph Amsilly. He may have showed some similar diagrams or similar slides. So I apologize for anything that, that may be repetitive um, here in the initial part of the presentation. But just wanna emphasize what soil organic matter is and the fact that the carbon within soil organic matter is what we consider soil organic carbon. And that soil organic matter is typically about 50 to 65% carbon. What's really important to, to note that other than fossil fuel carbon, soil organic matter is the largest terrestrial sink of carbon in the world. Um, so we know there's a lot of carbon within our oceans, um, but there's also a ton of carbon within our soils. And soil organic matter is really the largest pool other than um, the fossil fuel carbon, as I mentioned. Um, and they store carbons, both organic and inorganic forms being um, carbon dioxide as well. So this is just a, a high level overview of once again, linking what we call kind of the green carbon cycle and the, and the blue carbon cycle, which is within the oceans. So as I mentioned before, the original source of carbon is coming from CO2 within the atmosphere. Um, and this, the inorganic carbon coming from CO2 that is fixed by plants, creating biomass and, and through photosynthesis and a lot of that fresh plant material um, will eventually become, as it decays and decomposed and is consumed by microorganisms, will enter the soil organic matter pool. Um, and the, the total amount of soil organic carbon is controlled by these inputs going into new systems and outputs being lost through decomposition or erosion. So really, what is soil organic matter? Um, and we can view it as a high level of, of material that is in the soil and it, and it contains carbon. It's de derived mainly from plant residues, these being both um, the above ground biomass, the, the litter material that may be left on the soil surface, as well as the roots. Um, and the roots play a really critical role um, in, in contributing to, to soil organic matter. And we know this when we think of cover crops and, and keeping um, the soil covered year round. Uh, the remains of, of dead uh, animal um, and micro and macro fauna and, and their excreta um, and living soil microbes. So microbial biomass, all of these enter the soil organic matter pool. And microbes themselves, we can think of fungi, um, actinomycetes, bacteria, and, and other microorganisms. Um, they process a lot of the fresh, ma fresh material, and then over time it becomes and enters this soil organic matter pool. Largely, um, most people think of soil organic matter as three types or three pools of soil organic matter, but we know this isn't black and white. We know there's a gradient here, um, but you can largely think of soil organic matter as three pools. These being the living, also often referred to as the active or labile pools, then the dead, which is our slow or our more humic um, type pool, and then the very dead um, being our passive and recalcitrant pool. And mainly um, 
that very dead pool is something like biochar that, that we're going to talk about today. And part of this has to do with the time and the degree of degradation within the solar environment. So here are just a few pictures here of, of some of those three different pools of solar organic matter. And we know all three of these pools really contribute to a healthy soil and a well-functioning system that leads to greater crop yields. I think everyone here really knows and understands the importance of soil organic matter. Um, I don't need to elaborate on that, but we know it has great impact for soil water and nutrient retention, um, and that the organic matter fraction really occupies a small portion of the overall soil volume, but it has an incredibly large impact um, when it comes to, to soil health. So here are just some images and, and a little bit more information on the that living pool of organic matter. And this is that, that um, readily available uh, active pool of, of microfauna uh, in the soil, earthworms, nematodes, mites, springtails. Um, and these really are the organisms that are making nutrients available that are in the soil solution available for uptake to the plants. They're helping in disease suppression and other um, physical soil parameter improvements. The dead pool, this is that middle, middle pool, this is a slower pool, and these are organisms that have recently died um, and crop residues that might be remaining on the soil surface or, or incorporated into the soil that can be consumed by microorganisms and um, have nutrients um, or help with, with microorganisms growing as well, and then that availability to plants at different points. Um, and so this is the pool of organic matter that microbes mineralize and, and make available to, to plants, as I mentioned. And then this very dead pool, this, this passive or recalcitrant pool. Um, and this pool of soil organic matter has kind of evolved over time in a more historic view of thinking about this humus pool. Um, a lot of questions about that, um, but this kind of the new train of thought is around this minerally, mineral associated organic matter and physical separation from microbes, um, both kind of a label pool of organic matter and then um, organic matter that's stuck to soil particles as well. And we know there are a lot of benefits even within this very passive pool of organic matter that does not have necessarily readily available nutrients like some of those, um, the more labile pools of organic matter. And so the best example we know what we're talking about today is biochar. It really fits into the stable recalcitrant pool of organic matter in the soil. So how is organic matter stored and stabilized in the soil? There are various mechanisms which how, um, of how organic matter stays in the soil through chemical bonds. Um, it can be physically protected within aggregates. Um, there's humification as well, um, but this is becoming um, or of smaller importance than, than it previously was thought. And then we know um, materials like biochar, which are the incom incomplete combustion, can really stay in the soil for long periods of time um, and be both physically protected and chemically bound to, to other particles in the soil. So within agricultural systems, we all know um, when we look at natural systems compared to managed systems like production environments, we're disturbing the soil, we're disturbing the natural functioning, and we tend to lose organic matter in these systems. Um, I really just like this image because it's a dramatic image of, of when we think from when cultivation started, well, a lot long ago, um, thousands of years ago, but in more recent times, if we think about industrial agricultural production and intensive tillage of the soil, we had a decline in soil organic matter. We were turning over the soil, disturbing it, and losing that um, um, material back to carbon dioxide in, in the atmosphere. Uh, fear. But we know that we can build soils back up through the addition of organic amendments. So we know soil management has a really important um, role in the health of our soils um, and their ability to function. So now I'm gonna move on to soil organic matters and how we can start to improve soils again. 
And so what is the soil amendment? Um, I really like to start off from, from the basis of, of what it is um, to then we can think of, about different types of soil amendments and what they can do in different settings. So there's the definition, any material added to a soil to improve its properties. And these can be physical, chemical, or biological improvements. And the idea is that by adding a soil amendment, it will eventually improve plant growth, often obviously yields and productivity within um, production environments. And so various um, improvements there from, from the rooting environment to improving microbial activity, um, and the physical structure of the soil, as well as improving water and nutrient retention. The quality of, of uh, soil amendments varies, um, and there are both organic and inorganic amendments. The ones I'm really going to show today are organic amendments. I'm not going to spend time on, on inorganic amendments, but I've listed a few examples there of different types of amendments that are commonly used within um, agronomic systems, or let's say agricultural and horticultural systems. So to take a break from, from me talking, I'm going to launch a poll question um, just to make this a little bit more interactive. Um, and before we move into biochar and move into a more discussion of soil amendments, um, here are some quick questions for, for everyone to answer. So Hopefully I launched that and everyone can see. Jenna, if there are any issues, just please let me know. Sounds good, looking good. Okay. So we'll just give this, um, a minute here and then I'm just going to check the chat while everyone is responding to the poll. All right, a few, a few responses so far. First question, have you heard of biochar? So far people say yes. Are you making your own biochar? No. Are you using biochar on your farm? No. If not using biochar, are you interested in trying it? Yes. And then what soil amendments are you currently using on your farm? Um, compost and compost teas, manure, mulches, um, leaving crop residues on my fields. And I'm glad so far nobody has answered, I do not add organic matter to my soils because we all know we need to be adding organic matter to our soils. It's very important. So I'm gonna give it another about 10 seconds and, and end it um, there. Okay, I'm going to end it, but um, and just share the results with everyone. But I'm going to keep moving on. So thank you all for for answering that poll. And so moving on to um, organic amendments may, or soil amendments in general, but really focusing on organic amendments. I always like to to mention and I think highlight the importance of before adding an amendment, just like when you're, before you are thinking about adding fertilizer to your soil, it's important to soil test and to know what you're working with and know what type of amendment you might need. Um, it's different when we're thinking about organic amendments, right? And we know um, there, there's decomposition and, and adding more will um, improve uh, the, the, the soil environment overall. But I just want to emphasize the need for, for knowing what's in your soil and, and obtaining that information often through soil testing. So one type of um, soil amendment are, are mulches. These are, these are often used in maybe smaller production environments where we're leaving straw, shredded leaves or, or grass clippings. Um, uh, on the field to, to decompose, to protect the soil surface um, and to help suppress weeds and, and build organic matter. And we know these have an impact on surface soil temperatures as well. So one, one type of soil amendment. Another one um, that is a similar idea to, to mulches, but can be is often utilized within slightly different cropping systems. Um, and we've seen this more so within our perennial fruit systems, our wood chips. Um, these can be great for, for helping conserve moisture, suppressing weeds, building organic matter in perennial systems. Um, 
and um, yeah, controlling weeds and, and other aspects there. And I apologize, the slide seems to have gotten cut off at the bottom there, but um, we know we have to think about not uh, necessarily incorporating fresh wood chips to, to the soil right away so we don't get nutrient immobilization. So often these are left on the surface to then decompose over longer periods of time. Another one, and, and this is one often used, I would say mostly by um, many organic producers, more in, in, in specialty crops, although I've seen it also used in, in turf grass production as well, are seaweeds um, becoming more common. There's a lot of work going on now within New York State around seaweeds um, and the potential biostimulant effect that they have on, on plants. So this is just um, kind of a, a well image of what fresh seaweed looks like after it's harvested and drying it down, processing it, and then applying it to fields as well. So we know seaweeds don't have macronutrient benefits, but they do provide some micronutrients and then this biostimulant effect, as I mentioned. Compost teas um, are becoming more and more popular, uh, something that could be applied as a foliar um, fertilizer as well as a soil amendment. And, and there's some evidence that they suppress pests and diseases, but people are really interested in them from, from enhancing and boosting the soil biology um, by directly adding microbial organisms to, to the soil. Um, but the quality of these vary because we know they are a living system and they, they are affected by moisture, affected by temperature and other things. But these are things that are becoming more and more of interest to folks. And I've gotten a lot of questions over the years about compost teas and do they work? Are they snake oil? On and on. Manure, something that's been used forever. Um, I, I had read some historical documents about agriculture actually within New York City um, before it became um, a massive city and all the horses and, and farms that were there and, and manure being um, applied to fields to enhance um, crop production. So we know there are many different types of manure, whether, whether it be cows, poultry, swine, um, horse manure, but these are an excellent source of, of nutrients um, and crop integrated crop livestock systems can be a, a great um, uh, practice for, for improving soil health. Lime, um, I think every, every farmer knows lime. I don't need to, to go into detail with this, but this is a soil amendment really to boost um, or alter soil pH. Typically nitrogen fertilizers in particular have an acidifying effect on the soil. So lime is applied to um, neutralize this acidity and bring the pH of the soil back up. And we know this is important because it has to do directly with the availability of nutrients for plant growth. Um, I do wanna mention that obviously there's dolomitic and calcitic lime, and there are differences to those. Um, if you need additional magnesium within your soil, you would go for a dolomitic lime. Another one that's, that's becoming of more interest to folks or more, more growers are hearing about, and there's a lot of research going on, or I wouldn't say a lot, but there's research going on in this area right now, folks at Cornell and others, um, but this idea of rock minerals, um, specifically there's a lot of interest in basalt and, and what are the long-term effects of applying polar, pulverized silicate rocks um, to organic um, carbon within the soil, um, and there's a host of potential co-benefits around using rock minerals, but just realize that this um, there's more interest in this area. There's still a lot of research questions, questions happening, um, but this is another soil amendment that is becoming um, available or of interest to more producers, not just in the U.S., but, but elsewhere as well. Another one that everyone knows about um, and, and folks are using are compost. Um, this is the last amendment I'm going to mention before moving on to biochar. But compost, this is a picture at the top here of just a three um, bin composting system from kind of the fresh material of adding those carbon and nitrogen inputs to this, this middle bin and then a um, uh, mature cured 
compost there. Um, so another way to add a lot of organic matter to the soil and, and, but it's important to think about the quality of compost as well and, and making sure that compost is mature or finished before application. So now moving on to biochar um, in, in the, the second half of, of my talk today of what biochar is. I, I always start with that because there's a lot of confusion about what biochar is. Um, and then I'm hoping to clarify what it can and can't do and some new tools that are available to producers um, to make decisions around whether biochar is, is good for your farm um, or it's something as, um, I know they're, they're technical service providers here, um, is this something um, that you want to recommend or would it make sense for the farmers that you're working with? So biochar, we know it, it's basically a charcoal-like material. It's produced through pyrolysis, which is the burning of biomass at high temperature in no to very low oxygen conditions. And I'll differentiate that when I talk, uh, when I briefly mention production um, types, but I know Mike's going to talk much more about the production side of things, so I don't want to spend too much time on that. But within the pyrolysis process, we take this, this feedstock, this is our starting material, and this can be any organic waste material. It can be crop residues, but obviously we don't want to take crop residues if they're having um, other soil health benefits. This can be manure, if it's dried down manure. Um, this can be woody material from, from dead or dying trees that have um, been harvested. This can be prunings from vineyards or orchards. So it's, it's that organic waste material through pyrolysis and we get three end products. One of those products being the solid biochar, which I'm focusing on here. So as I mentioned, um, it's a charcoal-like material and it looks a lot like charcoal, but it's different from charcoal because it's not a fuel. It's used for agri agricultural and environmental applications. Very high carbon material. And you can think of the, on a, on a if you look under a microscope at the, the biochar physical properties, it looks like a sponge. There's larger pools, there are larger pools, pores, sorry, smaller pores, um, and, um, and it's got a carbon backbone to it. And that's really the structure that makes it recalcitrant or a long lasting amendment when it's applied to the soil. Biochar um, has numerous soil, uh, numerous potential properties. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here, getting excited talking about biochar. Um, numerous potential benefits um, within agricultural and environmental systems. And I say potential because I will uh, clarify down there that we're thinking about the correct biochar to the correct soil type to have a particular impact. But here's a wide range of potential impacts it can have on um, the environment. And these aren't just the only ones. And I do want to say there are many uses of biochar beyond agricultural applications to actually using them in building materials like drywalls where we can make building materials um, carbon negative um, and carbon sinks. Biochar is not a new idea. Um, many folks here have probably heard it or read about the terra preta soils in the Amazon, which is really, I think, where the modern idea of biochar came about. But this is an ancient technology and biochar is this really new take um, on an ancient practice where we've seen high fertility soils in, in parts of the world that are, that are naturally highly weathered and lower producing soils because they have higher rates of um, decomposition um, and they're not able to store as, well, they are able to store carbon, but they're, they're highly weathered um, and they might be more acidic. Um, but we know through organic additions and long-term organic matter additions, we can build fertility within these soils, as you can see in the image here. And we know there's soils like this in the US, particularly the Midwest, um, and that largely has to do with repeated prairie fires in places like Iowa, where, where we know a lot of the, the carbon in those soils is actually kind of, it's like a charcoal 
um, and recalcitrant form of carbon. So biochar production, and I know Mike's going to talk about this and the field day is going to show this, but I just, I like to have this slide that biochar can be produced and is being made um, at many different scales, all the way from these integrated bioenergy systems, which are really geared towards producing gases and oils used for other applications, all the way down to um, stoves that double as cook stoves in um, smallholder farmer areas or um, within subsistence agriculture. So no, there's a wide range um, of production technologies. And, and these ones on the lower end are where um, we get might get some oxygen into the system. It's hard to completely eliminate that there. Um, and there's production happening on farms and there, there's ways that it can pr be produced with um, organic waste materials directly on different operations. Beyond the, um, there are many climate benefits and that's one of the key things around biochar and in a lot of interest in biochar because um, it can not only aid in, in climate mitigation but adaptation as well and that it's a long-term storage of carbon in the soils. Um, there's work that's been happening um, by researchers around the world in thinking about the potential of different biochars to, to help in um, reducing current anthropogenic carbon dioxide levels. And one of his main benefits, no matter where we are applying biochar, is that it builds carbon in our soils and it sequesters carbon. Some more work, and this has been of interest to folks within New York State as well, but this, this figure on the right here is actually have some recent work coming from California and looking at applying biochar to composted dairy manure. Um, obviously, the dairy industry is huge in New York State as well, so there's more interest in, in finding ways to reduce methane, um, and a, a potent greenhouse gas, um, from the dairy sector. So there's evidence that really biochar can play a role in reducing methane emissions from, from dairy facilities. So this, this image is, is getting at the stability of biochar within the soil environment and the fact that it's part of the dead or this recalcitrant pool of soil organic matter, and it degrades over hundreds to thousands of years. Um, and it degrades on much long, long longer time scales compared to the comparable uncharred um, organic matter. But we also know that the stability of, of biochars vary depending on um, that feedstock I mentioned, whether it's made from, from grass clippings or manure or, or a woody feedstock, um, as well as the production conditions as well. So this image on the left for those who haven't seen it before, um, are this degradation rate over a short-term, relatively short-term experiment, how much of that biochar remains in the soil um, when it's coming from, from different feedstock materials. So you can see there is some variability there, as well as the production conditions, thinking about pyrolysis temperature. We know that the higher the pyrolysis temperature, um, the, the greater the fraction of biochar that will persist in the soil for more than 100 years. Um, the H to C or hydrogen to carbon ratio is typically um, the, um, the uh, variable, the parameter used to indicate stability of biochar in the soil. And the lower that um, H to C ratio is, the greater their stability in the soil. And we know that has a direct connection to the pyrolysis temperature um, that's used to make the biochar. But this diversity, this, this feedstock diversity, this production diversity leads to different impacts that are soil, crop, biochar, environment, and management dependent. So this is the S by C by B by E by M um, impacts. And we also know biochars, because they are organic matter, even though they are recalcitrant, their properties change over, to time, over time as well. They're physically degraded, chemically degraded, and biologically. So there is some um, variability um, over time as well, even though they are largely stable. 
And so we have an incredible technical understanding of biochar. Um, and this is shown by this figure here, which is from a recent publication that's showing there's, there's really over the last decade been close to 30,000 peer reviewed publication that talk about biochar or have a study around biochar. But we know there's this complexity and the site specificity um, associated with biochar based on some of those parameters I just mentioned. So we're not seeing widespread adoption of biochar yet because there's still um, this, this uncertainty and producers don't want to introduce more risk into an already inherently risky business. So what's important when, when thinking about using biochar or um, working with someone who, who's interested in biochar is talking about what is the problem you're trying to solve? What is the limiting factor within your production um, system or the research concern that you're having on your farm? Um, we know biochars are not one size fits all. And um, we don't want to just spend money and, and use biochar to use it. Um, we're thinking about what, what is the reason, identifying our goals and figuring out what's the right biochar for our right um, soil. Um, are we wanting just to increase carbon in our soils? Are we looking to increase water and nutrient retention, infiltration, structure? We know biochar interacts differently and has a different effect in clayier soils versus sandier soils, which I'm going to mention um, in a little bit. But just something important to think about um, that what, what is the issue that, that you might be having on your farm or a farmer you're working with? And this, um, this idea and thinking about um, why are we using biochar, we can really learn a lot, I think, from the four R's of nutrient stewardship. And, and this is not my idea here. This is something, um, there's, there's a paper on this, but taking a similar idea of the four R's and applying them as the three R's to making biochar decisions. So learning a lot from all the work that's been happening around nutrient management and thinking about that in the context of, of biochar applications. Thinking about the right source of biochar, so that right starting material, what's the feedstock? Do we have a woody, is woody, um, are woody materials more readily available in New York, in the Northeast compared to um, oat holes or something like that. What's, what's the right rate for our soil type and, and the resource concern we have? The right place. Are we working within perennial systems or within annual cropping systems? Where we apply that biochar, how deep we apply that biochar are all really important. So this is some way um, to think about biochar applications and thinking about in the context of, of nutrient management as well. We know overall that biochar improves soil health and can be an important part of any producer's soil health management toolbox. It is another amendment that is available for producers to use. And we know generally it has um, significant positive impacts on the soil environment. So this slide is just summarizing some of these benefits. This slide here is. Um, and, and I've showed this before in, in presentations that across thousands of studies around the globe that biochar generally positively impacts numerous agronomic parameters. So on the left here, we can see the, the parameter of interest, whether it be photosynthetic rate, water use efficiency, crop yields. And when we look to the right of zero, that's a positive impact. Um, and to the left, a negative impact. But overall, for something like crop yield, we see around a 10% impact um, increase in crop yield when we're applying the right biochar um, in the right soil type. So overall, there are positive benefits to a wide range of parameters, not just water retention or for carbon sequestration, but microbial cycling, um, nutrient retention, uh, and in general for, for, for soil health. One thing I did want to highlight, and this was some, some relatively recent work that came out of some modeling um, by researchers down in Texas at Rice University, 
and looking at the potential of soil water holding capacity to be improved by biochar. And I just want to highlight um, that there are opportunities for biochar to um, improve water retention, water holding capacity in soils within New York. But as we see here, and I'm going to uh, mention a little bit later, is that the benefits are going to be the highest in sandier soils in the sandier parts of our state. So actually in regions of the Hudson Valley um, and Long Island are likely to see more benefits um, in terms of soil water um, with biotar application than parts of, let's say, the Lake Ontario region um, and the southern tier. I'm not going to get hung up on talking much about application rates right now. I know this is of a lot of interest to producers, but I, I do want to show some more of the decision support tools at the end. And I, I um, have a lot in my presentation and, and not enough time to talk about it at all. Um, there are different application rates depending on the soil type and this decision support tool um, that I'm going to mention will, will assist with this moving forward. But the one thing I do want to highlight in this context is that more is not necessarily better when we're applying biochar. Um, we're not thinking about excessive 20, 30 tons per acre rates, we're thinking smaller application rates, potentially repeated application rates, depending on the cropping system we're working in. But it is important to, to mention that biochars really need to be inoculated, that, that starting, um, that freshly produced biochar is, is, is the carrier, it's the backbone, it's a relatively inert material and mixing it with some high value nutrient material, whether that be a manure or a compost is really important. Um, there is evidence that if you're applying biochar just as a freshly um, produced material, it's going to suck up the nutrients within the soil, um, leading to immobilization and potentially having a negative effect on crop yields. So thinking about applying a small amount of biochar with a nutrient rich material. I think this is this is very important. And this is more, if you look in the literature, this is more where we see the greatest benefits of biochar is when um, they're mixed. And there's a synergistic effect of kind of that quick released nutrient availability coming from manure and compost, and then that more um, recalcitrant um, carbon structure with the biochar. I want to launch a second poll question here before we move on. Let's see. And before I talk about barriers to, to adoption of biochar, some points, um, I wanna see what everyone thinks. In, in the context that you work in, where, where, what barriers do you see to adopting biochar currently, um, whether you're a farmer or you're working with farmers? And Jenna, I think I have like a few minutes left. Yes, yeah, uh, a couple minutes. Um, and then if you want to take questions after your presentation or at the very end, it's up to you. Okay. I'm going to go through these last slides quickly, but just highlight them. Okay. Uncertainty, cost, availability. So it sounds like there's more technical assistance. People are aware of it now. Um, there's obviously a lot of research that's been done, need for, for trials. Awesome, great. I'm gonna end this and keep moving or I can share results quickly. But... Okay. So to move on, um, we know that producers in New York State are using this, and we know producers around the country are using this, um, but these it still remains on higher value specialty crops. These are some of the areas that biochar that I know of is being used in New York State. It is also using used in, in field crops, but to a much smaller um, extent, and we need more on-farm trials within the state under our production conditions to really see, does it have value? And as some of you pointed out, one of the limiting factors and barriers to adoption of biochar um, is both its availability and its cost. It is 
more expensive than other um, uh, soil amendments, and we know that. And and as the industry go, grows and it becomes more available available on the East Coast, um, this cost is likely to drop. And there are many low cost opportunities for for producers to make biochar them themselves. Um, and you get obviously a lot of long term benefits from using biochar, not just these annual um, nutrient availability you might get from compost and manures like that. And a lot of the, the cost around biochar currently has to do with um, transportation and it being moved across the country. But I do want to highlight this. I'm not going to get um, hung up on it because um, I know I'm already over time, but I do want to mention um, a new conservation practice standard available by the NRCS. And I'm going to refer everyone to go listen to an excellent webinar that was just organized by United States Biochar Initiative and the NRCS that talks about the nitty gritty of this new financial assistance program. Um, field applications of biochar, I'm happy to talk um, with folks later on about different um, field application methods to different cropping systems um, and different methods of incorporation, whether you are a no-till producer or, um, or not. Just gonna, I'm moving through this slide quickly, but where do we apply biochar? And where do we think about applying biochar? And we know um, from, from on-farm work, from, from other research that our sandier soils are more degraded soils um, where we're looking to build organic matter, where we might have acidity issues. These are likely the spots where we're gonna see a positive response and yield from biochar applications. Um, so this um, it may be what it looks like within New York State. And I've showed this map before, and I wanna tie this map that was um, really produced by one of my colleagues, um, Professor Duco Hockey, who was at the University of Illinois, but is not anymore. And the work he did that really led to then the integration of um, a or the creation of this dynamic soil properties response to biochar tool within web soil survey. Um, so this is something you can do when you're sitting at home over the winter, whenever, and you can look at your fields um, and get some idea of given my soil types, is there a potential um, benefit from applying biochar within my um, to my fields? Regardless of cropping system, this is really tied into um, the soil survey data and information, and it gives you a rating of excellent to unsuited for the potential increase in crop growth through biochar applications. Um, there's some assumptions here within that tool, um, and it's based on a single application rate in this, this single corn stover plus manure biochar type. But it's a really excellent tool that gives um, producers some insight into, should I even be thinking about biochar within my system? Um, will it make sense? Are my soils already productive? Or do I not have the right soil type for getting an, a return on investment from utilizing biochar? So I encourage everyone to go into Web Soil Survey, find this tool under the Soil Health tab, and, and um, look at your fields or the fields of producers you're, you're working with. And the last thing I, I do want to mention um, is a biochar decision support tool that is available. Some of you just mentioned in that little poll that you're looking for some decision support tools. And this is a tool that was started as the um, Pacific Northwest Biochar Atlas. So it was developed um, by uh, a really great soil microbiologist, Kristen Tripp, and, and other uh, researchers for Pacific Northwest biochar producers and users. And so the biochars that are within this tool right now are only for the Pacific Northwest region, but there's work um, ongoing right now to expand this to a national biochar decision support tool, but it's still very useful 
Um, and I encourage everyone to go to this website. And um, once again, you can mess around with your soil types. You can import your soil types. You can import biochar properties and it will help make decisions. Is this the right biochar for the right soil type? Um, and does it make sense economically as well? So this is available. Um, and if you're looking for a tool like this, um, please go and, and play around with that. And the last thing here is coming to New York in June, um, the International Biochar Initiative will be leading the first ever Biochar Academy. Um, this is gonna be a two week intensive training for biochar producers, end users, technical service providers. And it's gonna have folks from all over the world attending this um, in Chenandegua. Um, and so this is a little bit far from the Hudson Valley, but it's much closer than another country. Uh, just keep an eye out for where I'm, I'm working with the IBI folks to see if we can make two days where we're focusing on agricultural uses, if we can treat this as a field day and have it open to farmers, service providers, and talk more in depth um, about some of the, the information I covered today. Um, so keep an eye out for that information. I will share it with Jenna um, and make it available to everyone. And you can learn more at this website here. So I apologize, I know I went over time, but if there is time for questions, I'd be happy to answer. I know Mike wants to talk, so feel free to follow up with me. My email is there as well. Thanks very much, Jenna. Awesome, thank you, Debbie, that was awesome. Um, if anyone has a quick question, um, maybe we'll take one now and then um, pass the mic over to, um, Mike and, and Jake, are you, um, were you able to join us via phone today? If you are, that you might have to unmute yourself. There you go. Mike and Jake here, can you hear us? Yes, yes, we can. Um, we'll have yeah, a, um, we'll have you talk for a little bit, and then if anyone has questions, I welcome um, you to put those in the chat. Um, but yeah, if uh, if Mike, you'd like to um, introduce your system a little bit and talk about what um, what we'll be um, able to see at the field day. Well, sure. Uh, thanks for having me there. We are a uh, commercial producer of. Uh, Pretty high grade biochar. It's basically a uh, it makes a base product for uh, probably a dozen or so different um, uses. But the ag use is important for uh, many things, and it is actually our lowest grade that we do produce. And it's all from uh, woody biomass, biomass, local. Uh, carbon circle is um, extremely local, so it's. I'm assuming it's good for the soil. That's all local. Yeah, Jake here from Ulster County Soil and Water. Uh, we couldn't zoom on because of uh, poor cell phone coverage. Uh, I did take some photos, but Mike and I are sitting here looking at his uh, biochar machine. And it's quite impressive. And he was saying he could do a cord of wood. He uses slab wood. He has a lumber mill. The slab mill uh, wood is used for biochar, and he could process one cord in 15 minutes. Some of the material is mixed. They like do a 50-50 with uh, compost, you know, from cow manure and horse manure. And the leaves, and that's a soil amendment that we're, we're, we're producing. The only soil amendment we're producing so far. Yeah, so uh, with me working with uh, conventional and organic producers, they've shown an interest in biochar, uh, namely because of lower soil organic matter, and I've given some samples to them. And the state, New York State, does cost share biochar application. I think it's roughly $1,000 an acre. Uh, that is cost shared. And I think the actual cost for the farmer against cost shared is about 
probably about twelve to thirteen hundred dollars an acre for the biochar as a soil amendment. You don't need a lot, you know, for an acre. So that's the cost share rate. And also, uh, I don't know if everyone's aware or not, but you, you normally only do this application one time because biochar lasts hundreds of years in the soil. Awesome. Uh, thank you both, uh, Jake and, and Mike. Um, now I'll open it up if anybody has any questions they want to um, either put in the chat or unmute themselves and ask for, you know, Debbie, Mike, or, or Jake. I welcome you to do that now. Um, there is a question in the chat. Um, would applying biochar with a synthetic fertilizer be sufficient to compensate for the nutrient leaching? Um, how do we know how much? Um, basically, nitrogen is the primary nutrient that leaches. So, but with the biochar, it, it would find nitrogen as compared to a soil with a low organic matter. The biochar increases the soil organic matter and the cation exchange rate. So I think it would work well. But you know, again, the main leaching nutrient is N nitrogen. It either leaches or it volatilizes. It's a synthetic, you know, if it's urea. And also it's best to mix with a compost like fertilizer rather than synthetic. Yeah, that'd be slow release organic nitrogen. It would convert. Um, we're looking at a package of Mike's products here that's mixed with um, compost and to, N is not analyzed. It's very difficult, but uh, looking at it now, uh, it gives you phosphorus. I'm not sure, there's no units, but it, it's 10.9. So it's probably if you spread it over an acre and uh, available nutrients, it's high. So 10.9 pounds per acre, which is sufficient high. Uh, potassium is optimum at 185.9 units. Uh, magnesium is low. Calcium is a little higher. You know, so it does have a lot of important primary nutrients and then macronutrients. Uh, manganese is optimal, boron is optimal. This was tested by Cornell and Rutgers. Zinc is low, but iron is optimal. So again, that's mixed biochar with uh, composted manure. And leaves. And leaves. Great, thank you. Yeah, I, the only thing I, I would add there too is that, I, I mean, it can be um, absolutely sufficient to compensate for the leaching. I, I have seen some variability as well in studies, obviously depending upon the soil type it's applied to and, and the biochar you're making it from. So this is again getting at the, um, you know, if, if nutrient leaching is something you're worried about, um, it's thinking about the biochar that you, you do use. Um, and and how much of that you're applying with the the synthetic fertilizer? But I but I would agree with with um, Mike that um, you know really combining that biochar with a an organic fertility source is is great. But there there have been there's there's definitely evidence that it it helps with nutrient leaching. Um, reduce nutrient leaching and, and help obviously with that retention of nutrients in the soil. Thank you. Um, as we wrap up a little bit, I know we're you know towards the end of our time. I'm going to just make a few announcements. But if anybody else has any you know further questions, I you know encourage you to put those in the chat. Um, so I just want to say thank you again um, to. Debbie, Mike, um, and, and Jake for those great presentations and everyone for attending today. Um, if you are interested in seeing a biochar system um, 
that's Mike's system in person, please feel free to sign up for the March 24th field day. That's part of the series. Uh, there are still a few spots open there. Um, just a quick note that the March 10th, um, we had scheduled a field day on climate battery greenhouses and agroforestry. That's now going to be a webinar on that same day, March 10th. Um, so the good news is, is if you're interested in this topic, but you're not in the Hudson Valley, you won't miss out. Um, and we'll provide more information on that um, on that webinar soon. And finally, we will be next week, fr uh, Friday, February 17th at noon for a presentation um, from Jake Wiedemeyer and Travis Ferry of the Ulster County Soil and Water Conservation District, as well as Brett Fox, um, to explain the concept and the practice of rotational grazing. So please join us then. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat for now, but um, if you have any, um, feel free to send them our way. Um, we'll make sure that those get to um, Debbie, and Mike, and Jake. And thank you everyone again uh, for attending today. Thanks, Jenna. Thanks, everyone. Have a good weekend.